Howard Jacobson. Welcome. Welcome to Veg Your Best. I'm so excited to have you have you on the podcast. I'm thrilled to be here, Michelle. Well, it's 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 you, I've I've talked about you many times on the podcast. I was lucky enough to be on your podcast. Um, plant mm -hmm. yourself. It wasn't it wasn't luck. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I played the long game too. Apparently, <laughs> we were just talking about that. But thank you. Um, maybe it wasn't luck. And um, and I've I've spoken many times on my podcast about you that you are one of the mentors, one of the people who accompanied me especially on my early journey towards uh, plant-based eating and veganism and the people you brought mm -hmm. to my attention in that area. Um, and now you're accompanying me as a professional plant-based person and professional vegan. So that's uh, really fun for, for, for all me. that, for all that accompanying my, my iPhone is not giving me credit for the steps. So no. I'm, I'm feeling a little chips. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, I guess we're doing it without, without the cardio benefits. All right. So I, the interesting thing is you've got a new book. You've, you've, how many books have you put out so far, Howard? Um, well, it's hard to say because I wrote a couple that never went anywhere mm. and uh, one that never got um, credited to me. But I guess since, since working on uh, in the plant-based world, there was two with Colin Campbell, uh, one with Garth Davis, two with Josh Lajani, Mm. And now this was I guess, the sixth with uh, Peter Bregman. That's uh, yeah. It's you have quite a body of work in this area. And the interesting thing is Peter Bregman, who I know has been a, I don't know if he, you call him a colleague or a mentor. How do you describe Peter in terms of oh, your oh, relationship he, with him? Yeah, he's always been a, a teacher and mentor and uh, a friend. And now we're you know we have been colleagues and now we're colleagues again. So yeah, because of, I because you know. he's more comes. For, through his mentoring and teaching from kind of executive coaching and leadership. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's true of any, you know, anyone who wants to make a difference in a field should bring things in from somewhere else. Right. So, you know, yeah. if like the last, if you, if you're a health coach and you want to learn more, like, you know, I mean, this is kind of how like, you know, um, governing bodies are set up. There's a certain, uh, a certain, set of places that you they want you to go for continuing education and those places are probably the last places that you're actually going to learn something new and valuable because it's all you know inside baseball mm -hmm. so um you know i thought that what i could bring to the plant-based world was business coaching and so that's you now that was the start of it and then when i when i was struggling to help people who are stuck with certain patterns i looked to uh, neurology mm -hmm. and to polyvagal theory. And I look to, um, you know, the, our understanding of stress. And so I'm, I'm constantly trying to bring things in from outside the field, which I think is where, is where progress happens. Well, I, I think that that brings us back right back to the book you've just released, because there's a, there's a lot of in information in there about how to stay curious and be open and, and be open to other fields and other things that maybe you mm. even have some pushback towards. So the name of the book is, and I want to make sure I'm looking down so I can say it correctly. You can change other people. And the subheading is the four steps to helping colleagues, employees, even family up their game. Wow. Did you print it out? I have it in my notes here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's de that's that would have been dedicated to well, waste I, that much printing. No, no, it's not pr actually handwritten. But well, actually, I, did. I, I printed out not the whole the whole. You were kind enough. Your publisher is kind enough to send me a PDF. I just printed out the table of contents because that was a good reminder for some of the subject matter that was in it. But anyway, it was it, it's a it's worth printing out very much worth printing out, but um, it's got a watermark on it. So I can't release it to anyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're going to have everyone who's listening is going to have to go to their independent bookseller or their That's online funny. bookseller. I remember in the old days when I was just doing, you know, sort of online teaching and everyone, we were all worried about piracy and people stealing mm -hmm. our stuff. There was actually this program you could buy that would, um, if you bought my PDF, it would watermark your social security number on it oh, and wow. your name so that you wouldn't be, you would be really reluctant to share it with anyone. I just That's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of genius. It sounds wrong, but it sounds kind of genius too. It's like yeah. holding your, your firstborn hostage or something like they did in the, 
in the uh, ancient ancient uh, diplomatic circles. <laughs> that's that's a historical reference I need to look up. Oh well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I'm kind of a geek <sighs> for that sort of thing. But the so anyway, so you can change other people. Who doesn't want to do that, Howard? Yeah, it's funny because I posted when I when I was starting to work on the book, I was looking for kind of examples that would be meaningful. And so I posted on my Facebook page, can you, you know, asking people, tell me, you know, some stories about people that you'd like to change. And everybody wrote back, I don't try to change other people. Mm -hmm. I just let, you know, like they were all like, like quoting the party line. <laughs> yeah, that's my party line. That's a party line I teach. Change yourself. Don't change other people. And I think what I when I read it, because I had that in my brain, don't change other people, change yourself. But there it is. It is a complimentary message with this book, I think, because the responsibility still remains on the person who would like to do some changing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And the you know, the way the way we think about it is so um, I was just I've been working in the garden this morning and I was clearing a path near the, the bed where we have the basil. And we have like seven different varieties of basil and they're just, you know, they're all beautiful and amazing. And, you know, you could say, well, my wife grew the basil, mm. but she didn't. <laughs> she can't mm. grow basil, basil grows itself. But if it hadn't been for my wife, there would be no basil growing. Those That's an excellent seeds, analogy, love that. Those seeds are self-generating, they're, they're self-organizing, they have intelligence, they have will, they have desire, they have qualities and characteristics, they can become themselves fully. And if my wife hadn't taken them out of these seed packs and put them in the ground and watered them and weeded and put them in the right place with the right amount of sun and the right soil, they wouldn't have grown. Mm. So did she change them? <laughs> you know, like, people naturally grow and change to become the, the more authentic, better, more capable, more fully actualized versions of themselves. And one of the things that we typically do is we get in the way of that, <laughs> right? What, so, is, what are some ways we get in the way of that? Well, by, by wanting them to change, <laughs> right? So the, like, Faster, you know, yeah. Yeah, like here's, you know what, Michelle, here's what you should do. Mm. I want to do the mic angle that you have right there is not quite right. I want you to change, you know, lower the stand, have it pointing up. Like all of a sudden I've taken ownership and I've decided, I've decided, oh no, it's perfect. I, I was just <laughs> drinking something. I've decided that something's a problem for you mm. and I'm going to tell you how to solve it. So at the beginning of the book, we talk about the four powers that people need in order to autonomously change. And the first one is ownership, that mm. if I don't own it, if someone else is making me do it. So you think about, you know, the, the classic lack of ownership is the school system, where kids come in, they've got all they come in with all this excitement and interest. And, you know, curiosity, like look at babies, how curious they are, you know, everything goes in the mouth. Wow. You know, I spent some time with um, three-year-old nephew uh and like you know every other question is why why like you know you could go crazy from from their intense curiosity and you know we can cure it with schooling right like yeah. here's what you got to study here's why and so we you know you take away ownership and then and then when we take away ownership then the best teachers are the ones who can do classroom management <laughs> who can say oh oh that teacher was so good he got the kids interested in astronomy. Like, how could you not be? <laughs> like, what did we have to do to their minds to make them default to not interested? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Or history? Like, you know, you talk, like now I'm really curious about the the firstborn children of diplomats. Like, I got to go look <laughs> that up because that's like really you know exciting and curious. Um, so I'm just I'm just reading Judd Brewer just came out with a recent book on anxiety. And in the book, he makes the case for curiosity because he's all into like mindfulness and, you know, curious exploration. He talks about the difference between like deficit based curiosity. Like when you think like, what was the name of that actor who was in that film? And then it drives you crazy till mm -hmm. you you look it up. And then there's sort of, um, you know, opportunity based curiosity. I can't remember exactly how he calls it, but it's sort of like now you just told me something about um, 
and you know, diplomats and their children being held hostage. I didn't know anything about that. There was no deficit, but all of a sudden I'm curious and I'm excited ah. and I wanna learn more. So now I have ownership. You didn't say, you know what, Howie, I want you to go look up this, or this is something you need to know, right? You, you, we had a, an organic conversation. All of a sudden now I am, I'm taking ownership for, I wanna find out that fact. So now, you know, stop me. How are you going to stop me? I'm going to go, I'm going to go exactly. look it up. But, it, yeah. but if you said, you know, right, give me 2000 words on the history of uh, di diplomatic uh, hostage taking from among firstborns, like, ugh, who, who the heck wants to do that? No, well, that's very good. And, and it's also, you come to this with one of your many, many careers and professions has been teacher, no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was the first one. That's really the archetypal profession mm. that I have. It's like, Interesting. you know, when I'm teaching, um, I'm, I'm in my element. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. Well, you are certainly an incredible communicator and teacher, at least, at least if mm. I'm, 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 I, in, I have been super influenced by you and learned so much from you. And that you were reminding me that the idea of when people are interested, let's see, there was one note I made that when someone is stuck in a problem, this is it from your book, you can change other people. When someone's mm -hmm. stuck in a problem, they'll always have a narrative about it. And what you just said kind of reminded me that idea that um, we don't, we, we, we stop being curious about certain mm. things when there is some negativity, there's some feeling of fear or judgment or defensiveness, we can kind of shut down with a story and something perhaps you've seen with children also when they're in a classroom environment, it gets, they can be shut down that natural curiosity. So part of what you talk about in your book, one of the steps is to try to be very curious as a, mm -hmm. the person to make an alliance between yourself and the person you want to change a little or uh -huh. a lot, and then show real curiosity about why you're coming at it from different ideas. Why don't you, can you tell me a little bit of that, that sort of process? Yeah, yeah, and just, you know, the basis is, is neurological that, you know, as, as organisms trying to survive on this planet, we are either looking for opportunities, you know, new resources, food, mates, places to sleep, or avoiding threats. Mm -hmm. And when you, if you roll the dice, it's probably a better idea to, to, to focus on avoiding threat. Because if you don't eat today, you can eat tomorrow. But if you get mm. eaten today, you're not eating tomorrow. Right? So our, um, our visual cortex, our, all our senses narrow when we feel like we're under threat. And one of the best ways to feel like you're under threat is to feel frustrated, angry, confused, you know, struggling with a problem. Yeah. Right. So then we can we can get very shut down. So that's why, you know, the, the two of the steps are really about flipping from negative to positive so that, you know, if you're curious about it's like if you ever have a conversation with someone who is genuinely curious about you, like what a pleasure. <laughs> you know, it's, be, it's like better than a massage. It's like mm. some, someone like really is interested and finds you fascinating. Mm -hmm. Right. Look what you just did. You nodded and you made mm -hmm sounds like that's like, woo! I love that. Right. That's like food. Like, you know, tell me more. Tell me more. Like, oh, wow, I'm important. I matter. Right. Like that is talk about a, a fundamental human need to mm -hmm. be esteemed by your tribe, to to matter, to belong. So like what, what you're doing right now, I know people, you know, your podcast aren't, aren't watching. <laughs> They should, you should, you gotta you have a YouTube channel because you're such a good visual one, listener. <laughs> one of these days, <laughs> but right. right. But so you're saying that if, if, if instead of, instead of me hearing that you're interested in me, I, I hear that you are dissatisfied or you think I should be doing it differently or I ought to change. There's a whole different <laughs> motivational yeah. triad that's been, been kicked off. Yeah. Can, can, can't you feel it? Think about the people in your life who are like, you know, you need to change your hair or, you know, are you going to wear that? Mm. Right. Like it could, I can feel the bristling. Mm. Welcome right. to my, my growing up time with my mother. <laughs> <laughs> hair and what I'm wearing were a constant issue. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure she had every best intention. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For right. sure.
So, yeah. but, you know, so, and, you know, like in, in the health field, one of the things that health coaches who come to take my training often have studied is motivational interviewing. And I don't have a problem with motivational interviewing in theory, but the way it's almost always deployed is, okay, I know what I want you to do. And now I'm going to ask you questions to try to get you to be motivated in the same way. Mm. Like, you know, oh, smoke, if sm you know, well, what would be the benefits of giving up smoking? Right. And I've got this, I've got this, you know, like I'm playing golf and I, I got my eye on the hole the whole time. And I'm just trying to move you there. Mm. And yeah, I can't do it directly, but I'm still, it's like the, the, the teacher who's trying to get you to say the right answer. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like that kind of Dr. Phil, uh, how's that working for you? That kind of, a, kind of a little bit of aggressiveness and a little bit of like, yeah. you and I both know what you should do instead of, uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the tools of motivational interviewing can be deployed beautifully if they come from a place of genuine curiosity. Like, gee, you know, tell me about smoking. Tell me, what, what, what's it like? Like, I, I've never smoked a cigarette. I don't know. What's it like to smoke? Like if you come from that particular and then the person feels safe, they don't feel judged. They can open up and they can say, you know, they might say, oh, it's the best thing in the world. I absolutely love it. It calms me down. It centers me. It gives me a buzz. It helps me think clearer. And I'm like, wow, that sounds great. So, you know, you're here because you're supposed to quit. Why would you want to quit? Like, mm -hmm. like genuinely, right. <laughs> it's, it sounds awesome. You know, right. like, well, it's, I, you know, I'm coughing a lot and it's going to take years off of my life. I'm like, huh, sounds, sounds like you, you're, you know, really conflicted. What's that like? Like, I, I'm genuinely curious about someone who gets so much benefit and is afraid of the negatives. Like, and can you see how that, that curiosity can get them to come to a place, a safe place to say, you know what, I could probably get those things another way. And I really don't want to die young. Like, huh. Okay. Sounds like you're pretty clear on that what do you want you know what would you like to do <laughs> right as because opposed it, to you it know really me. Impart, yeah i'm sorry yeah go, go ahead. ahead i was saying it really imparts a sense of respect for the person that you're talking to and a sense that they do know what's best for them they may not be doing it right at the moment but they have they have all the tools they really need to um do what they want yeah yeah and it's so that i mean i love that word i don't even know if we use it in the book but you know it could be the title, um, you know, is how, how, to, how to speak to people respectfully. And, you know, the respect comes from the Latin to, to spec, to, to look at, to like see. spectacles, to mm -hmm. see, um, which means if we're, if we're superimposing our vision of who, what they should be over them, then we're not seeing them, then there's no connection. And the problem is not, it's not like an ethical thing, like a moral thing, like this is how you should talk to people. But if you wanna have influence, you know, you start with where they are, who they are, and you form this alliance so they feel safe with you, and then they can start to open up. Like one, one of my favorite stories from the book is, is uh, my co-author, Peter Bregman, who's been trying to get off sugar for years. <laughs> and I've been trying to help him for years. So, you know, <laughs> it's funny that uh, that's kind of, you know, like we're the, we're the experts on this and neither of us has quite figured it out <laughs> individually for, for ourselves or... or, or within the relationship but he's like you know i know i shouldn't have that th third bowl of ice cream but when somebody if i if i reach for it and somebody says are you really going to have that third bowl of ice cream like he's like i'm going to double down definite like, hell yeah i am just watch mm. me mm. <laughs> i want now and so so let's use that so obviously you haven't so far um changed peter bregman's sugar sugar intake maybe maybe you have maybe you have helped him lower it but what what, what is the area because this is you said i'm, I'm gonna just start that over again you said at the beginning that when you asked people about changing other people most of the feedback you got was no i don't change other people i on the other hand was asking this week about who would you know uh, that I was going to speak with you. And the title of the book is you can change other people. Everybody wanted to change someone. So well, they wanted the to difference is 
your people are just more honest than my people. Oh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe because <laughs> there, there were a lot of spouses who need to eat differently, apparently uh -huh. in America. <laughs> yeah, no, that was what, that was what was frustrating. It's like we do it all the time, but we're just, mm -hmm. you know, th th these people who've been in my Facebook group were like, oh, I know the answer to this one. That was that's a trick question. Uh huh. Uh huh. So let's. So you know, it comes up this idea of Peter Bregman and his ice cream, and you as a coach. Um, what what kind of um, techniques you might use to try to respectfully help mm -hmm. help Peter change or help mm -hmm. some one of my clients' um, husbands change? Because this is, I think, you know, in the plant based community and the vegan community, we are often evangelical and um for want of a yeah. better word and yeah. missionaries and we want and sometimes um and sometimes for ex excellent excellent reason we know better <laughs> mm -hmm. right so what do we do there what what's one right. thing we could start to do there well so i think it, it all starts with step one which is um to become an ally rather than a critic mm -hmm. right so we've seen how the, the energy of the critic just turns people off and makes them want to run away and so, you know, if if we really want to have that conversation, we have to become an ally. And so the way I like to start is to become an ally of yourself. Right. So a lot of people know, yeah, I shouldn't change. I, I can't help myself. I keep blurting this out. I keep, you know, damaging the relationship. What's wrong with me? Why can't I just do this? And so let's let's practice on ourselves by getting in touch with well, what's my positive motivation. Right. So the uh, the couples therapist, marriage, marriage therapist and researcher John Gottman talks about these bids in relationship where someone can sort of turn towards you, turn away from you or turn against you in conversation. And this is the most important thing when it, whenever any of that happens is the, the couples that don't divorce, you assume positive intent. Hmm. Right. In the other person. So this is really what what allyship is about. So what's my positive intent in wanting to change my spouse? It's not that I'm overbearing. It's that I want them to be well. I want them to live a good life. I care about our life together. I care about them being a good role model for our children. All right. It would be nice if we could eat the same foods. It would be nice if I didn't have to cook two meals and, and I had more energy. Right. These are like get in touch with all the positives. And that's really good practice because then you're going to have to get in touch with the positives about the other person's behavior and this person who's driving you crazy. <laughs> like why, you know, why is your spouse in eating a, an unhealthy meat filled diet? Right? Like what's their positive intent? Well, you know, most people want to feel good. They want to enjoy life. Right? So eating these foods, it reminds her of her childhood. She's, you know, it's comfortable. She knows how to make it. Uh, you know, when she's sad, she can, you know, pop a burger in the toaster and feels better. Mm -hmm. Like, like all these are positives. They're, 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 they're human needs that are quite valid. And so it's like, oh, she, you know, she wants to feel good. So then we can go and say, well, what's the, where's the intersection of what I want and what they want? Where, where is there a, a joint um, outcome that I can imagine for us? And then from that place, you can begin to explore with curiosity. So I would say, like, if you don't, don't if like do that work first, mm. so that you sort of let go of the judgment of the I am better than them, I know better, right? Like I know better than them is really no different from I am better than them. Yeah. In, in, in how it in how it plays out. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that, that goes along with the kind of coaching I do, which is typically that how and the plan comes after we've got our thoughts and our feelings and our kind of our, our whole energy in the right space. Because the plan, if you go, which I, I know I've done as a parent, um, is like, no, no, we're going to do this, 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 this order, get check it off your list. And until you've got that, um, the energy of of connection and why and shared vision, it can never, it, it can just, it's just, it's, it's just micromanaging a bunch of ticks on a box. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as coaches, we, we, we love to solve problems. We love to, you know, like, Oh, I know how to do this one. 
And the truth is we don't, and we don't know the nuances. And even if the advice is perfect, if it's our advice, we deprive them of ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is like, if they, if they could have solved the problem with their current level of thinking, they would have solved it, mm -hmm. right? People barely come to coaching like, hey, I never thought of this before. They're, but they're, they're like, I've been trying to lose weight for 30 years. I've tried everything, right? They've tried everything, but from a particular mindset. Mm. So our job as coaches is to sort of loosen that up. And, you know, one, one of the things that, that invariably happens when I'm coaching someone is that we discover or they discover with my help a blind spot, mm. right? Something, some, and, and usually, you know, you talked earlier about like this, na the narrative that we have that keeps us stuck. They usually, that's the same thing. Like the blind spot is part of the reason they're stuck. Like, and once they have a different perspective, oh, okay, so I'm, I'm eating when I'm tired, right? So, the, so, so maybe, oh, the insight is, this is not about food management, it's about energy management. Now, all of a sudden, we have 23 new ways to approach it. All right, as opposed yeah. to, okay, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do this. Okay, when are you going to do it? Put it on your calendar. What are you going to do? Right, the sort of... Um, you know, cut, cut and dried coaching that I, uh, I see very often, like there's a place right. for that. But we don't because then the client has that. has his own curiosity or her own curiosity into because we're reminding them that what they're doing now makes sense to them. It, it's perfectly sensible if they're already engaging in that behavior, or that activity or have that, that, uh, that um, proclivity. It make it's because it makes sense. It, it's working mm -hmm. in some in some way. So if we can poke holes in it just by being curious and opening, then they get to see it because what we see doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Ba any bad habit will give you positive reinforcement right. in the moment of doing it. Mm. Now, one of the questions that came up on one of my my followers was specifically about a spouse. Well, more than more than one spouses. Two different, diff two different followers, spouses who the husband feels meat is basically synonymous with being eating a masculine diet, a mm -hmm. diet that will fuel an, a man. And in those two cases, an older, middle-aged, slightly older male uh -huh. needs that kind of fuel, that kind of nutrition. So she was like, you know, throwing all kinds of information and Dr. Greger, <laughs> everybody at him and it's not working. Right, right. Yeah. So our first impulse is, hey, watch that scene in Game Changers where they where they do the erection study and the college athletes. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you yeah. know, oh, well, manliness, you know, oh, the, 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 you know, do you want a sausage or a carrot? You know, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. like we, we all know the talking points. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so what, would you, what angle would you have her either retreat to or, or go forward towards? Mm -hmm. Well, so there's three ways to have the conversation. One is that we um, initiate it, right? And this is, this is very common. At, it's okay at work. Like if you have someone that you're working with and you're kind of responsible for the mm -hmm. deliverables, you can say, hey, can we talk about something? I'm, um, I'm struggling with this. Can we talk about it together? And you can bring it up. Mm -hmm. the, that's the hardest way to do it, especially you know, when, when it's none of your business. Like, right. hey, can we talk about your meat eating? Yeah. <laughs> right? The <laughs> yeah. easiest way is someone comes to you and say, hey, I'd like, I'd like help with this. I want to I wanna change, right? Then it's, you know, okay, great. Let's, let's roll up our sleeves. There's a middle ground. There's, there's silver platter opportunities that come up that we miss all the time because we don't know how to recognize them. And my favorite one is complaint. So, you know, I used to get really annoyed when people complained, right? Because and my definition of complaint is expressing dissatisfaction without attempting to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty common thing. We, we can all fall into that. But when somebody complains about something that's even tangentially related to the thing that I want to talk to them about, now I see it as a huge opportunity. So does the husband ever say, boy, I wish I had more energy. Boy, I wish um, I had a better, you know, bowel health. Mm -hmm. Boy, 
Like, are, are, is there anything that bothers the husband about his life that you can, that we, with our knowledge, we can relate to the diet? Mm -hmm. And then say, well, you know, it sounds like, and, we, and then then empathize and then don't, so we won't just jump don't in. Don't jump in like lying in wait. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. And again, let's get curious. What's this yeah. like? All right. And so, you know, there's no, if people are looking for sort of a direct path, there's no direct path. There's the, there's, um, you know, the Advaita um, meditators talk about the backward step, right? If you want to move sort of forward into a spiritual practice, you don't go charging in, but mm. you sort of take a backward step, create space. So the first thing is, if you've been having this argument with your husband for years, it's time to create space. It's time to time to do something different. Um, I interviewed recently um, a, a, an expert on conflict resolution uh, for my podcast. Um, and uh, there's a, uh, Jen Goldman Wetzler, who's done a lot of work uh, with Harvard Negotiation Project, with Middle East, you know, very, very high level tense negotiations. This is like the main, yeah, again, you do all your prep work uh, internally, but the main thing you do is something unexpected, right? In the negotiation, you respond differently than the person expects you're going to respond. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it shakes things up. Mm -hmm. So if you're used to this fight, you know, say, tell, you know, tell me about that, uh, you know, the, 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 the weight, what's, what bothers you about it? As opposed to, you know, stop tucking in your shirt, you look fat, right? or whatever, whatever. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. To get uh -huh. curious and to, and to create, to create openness in the relationship until when, when they, when that husband doesn't feel pressured or judged anymore. Now, all of a sudden, you don't know where the conversation could go. They might mm. be really, really eager to change some things to get different outcomes. And they're just, you know, their pride, like Peter with his third bowl of ice cream, their pride is, is actually, so we, we are creating resistance. We are, we are fueling their resistance. It's like they plug their resistance into us and we are the power source for it. Hmm. Right. And I think that's a good, it's a good example because what you're saying is the reason why I would say I don't try to change other people in general. I, it, when I, when I notice it in me, I really try to get busy with me mm -hmm. because I have never really seen this sort of uh, technique that, that you're talking about. I, I've, I've, it's never seemed like something that would work well for me. And so that you have made it into steps and that you have so many um, good, you know, visual example, visual examples that make me able to visualize those steps mm -hmm. um, is, is very intriguing. And, and I think that people are really going to yeah. love reading this because my default has just been in, in my, you know, later middle life was just like, eh, you do you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and you know, what I, what I was just thinking, I hadn't thought about this before, but when you, you said earlier, like, you know, and we know we're right. Mm. Like, I thought of that as sort of a bad thing, right? Mm. That belief in my own rightness, like, of course, the plant based diet is the best diet, right? Of course, whatever I believe is the right thing to believe. But I think it's actually a really useful part of the process. Because if you truly believe that a plant based diet is going to help this guy, Mm -hmm. live a better life, even though know, he's stubborn, he's got all these crazy masculine beliefs tied to food and identity. But if you really know in your heart, that your way is better, that gives you the opportunity to let go of it. Because you're, you're right, we only hold on with faith to things that we don't really believe in. Like, how hard are you going to try to convince somebody that the sun's going to come up tomorrow? Right, right, you gonna let Good that go. Point. Right. So the fact that you have this faith in, in the rightness of your path means you can let go of it and just let nature take its course, let the conversation flow. And if he becomes open to experiment, know that the experiment is going to prove itself to him when, once he becomes willing. Like what we really want people to do is not to change in a particular direction. We want them to try new things. Right. So, you know, honestly, I don't know if a plant based diet is the best diet. I mean, you know, I've, I've staked my career on it, but honestly, I'm humble enough to say, like, there might be research out there that I don't know about. There might sure. be people for whom 
having some animal products is beneficial. There might be ways. I mean, if I look at indigenous people who all include hunting in their and trapping in their diets, I can't say that they're wrong. Um, you know, so just having the humility to say like, let's, you know, what do you want to try? And let's, let's worship reality rather than our, our dogmas. I love that. I love that. That's what I, I, you know, the name of this podcast is Veg Your Best. The coaching I do, I am as pretty, as strict as I can possibly be practice. I don't, I don't eat any animal products. There are still animal products in my surroundings. I have not taken the liberation pledge and just will not eat with people who, who eat animal products. There are animal products still in my home. Some things I still use that um, have, that I have not replaced. So I'm, I'm not on the, I'm not a fifth, what is it? Level five vegan from the Simpsons. Nothing, nothing with it casts a shadow, but um, (laughs) I'm, I'm, but yet my coaching is always open to anybody wherever they are. And, um, and, and because I don't know, I don't know what other people should do for their health. I, I, I have my ethical views and I also know that they came after I spent some time being open to the health concept. And I, to me, mm-hmm. it's a process for most people. So I think that, I think this is a wonderful, this humility is important with, with any of us who would like a different result around us, not just clients, but in our, our families, in our, in our careers, in our co- among our coworkers. It's super important, that idea of being curious, curious mm-hmm. and humble. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that you can't give advice. Right. So if, if you have developed uh, expertise and experience, we don't want to withhold that from people, right. but we, we don't want to beat them with it either. Right. So the, the advice is really useful if someone says, hey, you know, like someone was uh, I had a call with an old friend um, yesterday morning who has been vegetarian for many, many years, but never vegan and like could like love dairy and eggs and and, you know, processed foods. And she's got a lot of joint problems and she needs to lose weight and she wants to reduce inflammation. And now she's asking me all these questions like, well, what can I do instead of bread? Or how can I, how can I enjoy this? And like when, you know, she's actually asking for advice. And so mm-hmm. partly I was saying, well, you know, tell me some things you like or what have you tried? You know, so, so I'm not just replacing her own natural because the second, the second power uh, of change is independent capability. So if I'm, if, you know, for example, if I just tell you what to eat every day, then you're dependent upon me to tell you what to eat every day. Uh, But there were moments where I was like, Hey, you know, um, have you, she, she, she loves soup and she's always had soup with bread and she doesn't want to have the the white bread anymore. Um, What can she do? Have you ever um, baked chickpeas, made them nice and hard, like croutons, right? Like, so I was able to offer that. She's like, Oh, that's great. I love that. Let me try that. Mm. Right. And I said, well, so what, you know, what spices do you like? How, 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 what are some different ways you can prepare them? So now she's developing ownership mm-hmm. um, and going to develop her own independent capability around it. But I, I wasn't like, you know, you, some coaches are like, you know, the client has all the answers within them. Like, no, I, you know, oh, I, I hear I, what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Right. Because I, I can be I like that. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and it's a lot of the time. It's true. It's a good default. Like, mm. you know, I hope the person who um, does my, my, when I get my, uh, my nasal surgery to open, to fix my deviated septum, I hope that person wasn't trained by someone who said, all the answers are within you. Of course. Right. I, yes. And I think the idea of the c- client knowing what's right or having the answers is that they will now find the answers when they're open to finding them. And all the answers were probably there. A lot of the information was there for them all along, but they've, for some reason, closed themselves off to it. Um, but I agree with you. I, I want my physician to um, <laughs> have, have, have studied a little bit of other people's, yeah. other people's wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, let's, so there are four basic steps. Do you want to mention what those four basic uh, four parts are? For, yeah. um, because there, this all comes a lot from this idea of emotional courage that I know that you talk about, that Peter Bregman's written about, that a lot of coaches use this idea that if you're willing to feel uncomfortable, if you're willing to feel 
that the, what's keeping us from doing things is our reticence or our, our what's that, what's the word our discomfort with being uncomfortable yeah um, so what are the four parts mm. that um, of, of of this process in terms of you can change other people right so we started out we had um permission was the first step and then outcome and opportunity and plan and then we realized the acronym was poop which we th we thought was a <laughs> a marketing problem <laughs> so, so we okay. went back, so we went back to step one and realized it wasn't just it wasn't about permission that was sort of an outcome of the step but what the orientation of the step was allyship that you're right. you're an ally as opposed to a critic so we changed it to ally oop and as a basketball fan alley oop is the pass that you make to a teammate to allow them to dunk so so that's that's my mnemonic ally and then oop, oop. outcome opportunity and plan mm -hmm. uh, so ally is the first step that's sort of an internal step and it ends with the person saying yes i'd love to think this through with you and by the way just you know just i hope everybody buys the book but if you don't like take away that phrase. And I got this, you know, this is Peter's work. Um, instead of, would you like help with that? Or would you like me to help you solve it or figure it out? His phrase is, would you like to think that through together? Mm. And that's such a beautiful phrase. First of all, it's very hard to say no. Yeah. <laughs> right. If I mean, you know, it's, it's easy if you really don't want to, but it's very non-threatening. It's not like, would you like help with that? Like we don't, you know, there's so many reasons you might say no to help. One is, oh, you don't want to bother me. Another is you don't want me, you know, stomping around in your brain with my muddy boots. But if you say, well, would you like to think that through together? That's such, it's such a generous and gentle offer. I just, I just love that phrase. Yeah, so this, I agree. That's a great ally, one. Ally ends with that, with them feeling like you're on their side, you're supporting them, you want what, what they want for themselves, and you're going to work with them to help them get it. So then the next step is outcome. And this has changed how I coach because, you know, talking to someone, okay, what's the problem? Then I would just go right into, well, tell me about it. Tell me what's been happening. Tell me what have you tried? And what Peter taught me was before you go there, establish what's a positive outcome that they want. Because now, you know, and, and you have to work on this a little bit. I want to lose the weight. I want to get off my diabetes meds. I don't want to feel so bad, right? All of those are negatives. Right. Those are all avoid negatives. So we want, we want the outcome. We want to help them get to an outcome that's positive, specific, and meaningful. Right? And so the book, you know, step two talks about how to get to those three qualities of what we call, what we call an energizing outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, we are now... Um, ready for step three opportunity. And the goal of step three is how is the problem that they're facing an opportunity to achieve that outcome as opposed to an obstacle to that outcome? Because the outcome, the, the energizing outcome is usually bigger than I want to lose weight, right? Yeah, it's that's like, one, the one you call the upside in the downside. Is that, yeah. is that the part? Yeah, I like that yeah. term too. Yeah, that there's almost, you know, that what people really want is, is, is growth is happiness, is a, is a bigger thing. The problem is usually a symptom of you know, the presenting problem, the thing they're stuck on, the thing that annoys them, the thing they're struggling with is usually a symptom of a bigger opportunity that they're not taking advantage of. Mm. And so it's almost like, you know, when um, if you go walking around with indigenous people who, who like, gather food, very often they'll you look at this at the landscape and you can't see anything but they'll see oh there's a root under there how did you know that oh well it's you know it's my home i know you know that leaf there or this the undulation of the sand or the tracks of a beetle like whatever it is told you that okay so there's something on the surface there but there's nourishment underneath mm. and so i want you know so, so once we have the outcome we can then return to the problem so tell me, how, tell me about the problem. Tell me how it manifests. Tell me what have you tried? Take me there. You know, help me see it in your life. And all while now, now because it's juxtaposed against the outcome that they want, we can begin to see that the problem is actually not a wall but a door. 
Right. Yeah, I love that. that you, you, there are a lot of great um, examples in the book about this idea that maybe in, in an office, the, we see the problem is that coworker that he or she is doing something and we want to fix or get rid of or neutralize that coworker, but that's, that's the wall. We want to fix the wall. But what we want is to have a, a more positive, more productive situation at work. We want to be able to communicate with other people. We want to be, have a more, a more growth experience at work. This is, it's a great, a great analogy to look at that, the, the wall and the door. I love that. Yeah. Cause, um, you know, the, we all want the problem to go away. Yeah. But if the yeah. problem just went away and, and you know, I, I mean, I can talk about so many people who, that I know who have been morbidly obese and they have lost the weight. And if I ask them, if you could go back to the time you were morbidly obese and, you know, snap your fingers and the weight would come off, would you have taken that path? Mm -hmm. And they're all like, no way. The weight was the least important thing. What was important, I was talking to um, Andrew Taylor, SpudFit, about what, you know, his journey was like, oh, thank God I was 100 pounds overweight because that was the opportunity to heal my addiction, to get to know myself, to do this hard thing, to go to the gym, the mental gym every day. Like that made me the person I am. I know so many people who have recovered from serious illness, who have, are in remission from cancer, who say, thank God that disease woke me up to what's important, yeah. right? Now, we don't want to tell that to people. Like if someone's got a problem, we don't want to say, oh, that's, yay, yay. I'm so glad you have cancer, Yeah. right? That's a little um, insensitive. Right. But, but, right. but for me, the, the, um, the, the, the litmus test of a good opportunity step and, and, and then moving for, further into the plan is that the person's going to look back and say, thank goodness I had this problem. Because hmm. this problem was the doorway to something so much more important, so much bigger. Yeah. Now, how, right? now like, that's, it, yeah, that's, that's an interesting area because I, I find some people much more, well, obviously in any given moment, people are shut down to that in, in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of bad news or a diagnosis or a family, family, you know, tragedy. Um, but some people do have that underlying sense of like, there's something in this for me. There's some, there, mm -hmm. I'm going to get something from this. Is, is that, do you think that's an in, I tend to think it tends to be a little bit ingrained in the personality because I don't, I don't know. I have no science for that. What do you work with so many people? What yeah. do you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. I'm guessing that there's, it's, you know, there's probably a genetic component. There's probably a, a condition, <laughs> a conditioned component. Um, you know, I mean, the question is, is, is sort of academically interesting. It's practically interesting only to the, to the extent that it, it guides practice. Right. So if I say, well, that's, you know, like, I'm not going to like coach someone to go from 5'10 to 6'3. Right. Because <laughs> that's, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have that much control over that. Right. Um, but as, you know, so as long as people can, can shift, you know, and, you know, largely this, this relates to the work that I do around trauma. And, you know, if the world, if your nervous system perceives the world as an unsafe place, it's very hard to maintain positive thoughts. Yeah. And that's why this whole idea of you know, affirmations and positive thinking, and even the whole premise of cognitive behavioral therapy, that dysfunctional thoughts lead to dysfunctional behaviors. Well, if someone is, is their nervous system is in a certain state that is precluding certain thoughts, and then you tell that person that the, their problem is their thoughts, now they're doubly effed. Yeah. <laughs> now, they're, now they're, now they're, you know, now they know better and they still can't do better. Now what's wrong with them? Mm. Right. So, I mean, part of the, you know, I feel like the, the, the four steps themselves can be healing in that we're, you know, just as a coach, one of the things we're doing is creating a space for people to be accepted for who they are, mm -hmm. right? No judgment zone. Someone comes and talks to you about their problem, even if they can't figure out, even if they don't solve it, they leave feeling normal. They leave feeling okay about themselves. They leave feeling respected right. and, and valued. And I think that's healing all by itself. Yeah. And when you can hold space for somebody and just really hold, 
if you can do nothing else, you can listen with respect and, and uh, a certain level of human to human love. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I ask people this in the, in the coach training that I do. Can, can you think of a time when you felt totally listened to, where someone was completely present for you? And most people can, but it's like a rare occurrence. It's like something they remember for the rest of their lives. Mm. Right. Like I, rem I remember one, I met uh, Sylvia Borstein, who's a, a Buddhist writer. I met her at a conference and I spoke to her for maybe eight seconds. It might not have been that long. And in that eight seconds, she sort of smiled, looked me in the eye, took my hand and made me feel like I was the most important person she had ever met. That has stayed with me. And it was on a line. It was like, it, there was no like illusion that this was just me and her. Like there were people, 20 people in front of me. There were 70 people behind me. Mm. Like, and still the, the, the being seen by her um, had that impact. And this would have been like in 1995. This is almost you know, tw 26 years ago. Mm. And it's, 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 it has stayed with me. Yeah. And it's a, such an example of what, we all have some ability to do, no matter what our training, no matter what our background or our interests are, we can always show up for one another, maybe not to the level of practice, um, you know, that, that Sylvia Borston did, but we can somehow show up with tremendous concentration and focus and, and respect for other people. When all else fails. <laughs> yeah, when all else fails, be kind. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And in fact, we, we started writing the book as a coaching manual. Like we mm. were thinking about it as here's, here's um, taking our coaching methodology. And, and as we started writing, we realized we wanted to do something bigger. Um, we want to make this a book for like coaching is such a cool skill set. And it's hard. It's counterintuitive. Like we have to resist natural human impulses to, to jump in, to give advice, to judge, to criticize, to do, right? Like the act of creating space is something that we had to practice and get good at. And so to offer that to the general public, to say like, here are, like we all want to, to see the people around us happy and not suffering and not struggling and to say, here are tools and, you know, and you think you can't change other people because the ways you try to help them actually make things worse. But here are tools and a process that can, you know, it's not going to work hundred percent of the time. The book is you can change other people, not you definitely will mm -hmm. change other people in every circumstance. Um, but it felt important to us to, to democratize these, these skills, because at the, you know, at the very least, people are going to become just better at, at I agree. I can't think, other. I can't think of a, of a environment where you could not use the information in this book, any kind, any kind of environment, whether it's in education, whether it's in business, whether I, certainly in coaching, obviously we could, we can use this all the time. It is um, a, a, one of those things where you can change other people and at the very least, you yourself will, I think, change for the better by using those processes. You will find yourself mm -hmm. a, a better colleague and a better employer mm -hmm. and a better coach or, and a better client, even if you are looking to be coached by someone else. Yeah, and it's, it's funny that, you know, the, the meta message of the book is like, we're going to teach you how to change other people. <laughs> like, so we're going to try to change you. Right. Um, <laughs> right. And, you know, obviously there's limitations to how, how deeply you can be in interactive relationship in a, in a written text, but we tried to write the, the book in a, as respectful a way as possible so that we, you know, even as we're giving advice and telling people what to do, um, we were trying to follow our own advice as much as possible. And you also encourage people to try it, not to practice, not to like memorize it and, and get it down perfectly pat, but to begin and I would think that there's no downside ever to begin with creating uh, an ally. Uh, you, you can always start there, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, just when we look at like, you know, the, the news and headlines and the world, like there's so much polarization that we get reinforced for, for being right with our side. 
right? If, if I post a meme making fun of the people I disagree with, I'll get a lot of positive strokes yeah. for that. Right. You know, if when Ellen DeGeneres is seen at a baseball game cuddling with George W. Bush, she gets vilified. Mm -hmm. And and I understand that. And I understand people's negative reaction to a politician who presided over wars. And, and at the same time, it's hard for me to, to want to say that any act of human kindness is, uh, is worthless or is, mm. um, is counterproductive. Right? Like, yeah, you I know, I think that's Maybe. a beautiful con concept to even end on, Howard. Is is there is there nothing's wasted in terms when you're when we're kind? You know, that's as as Peter and I were finishing the book, we were we were discussing all these things back and forth. We haven't seen each other, you know, in in years in person because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he said was like, you know, when I use this method, I always feel good afterwards and during. But when I'm judge, when I'm clever and judgmental, and I'm trying to convince someone and argue, because we were talking, we we wrote a piece for uh, for CNN last month about how to talk to the unvaccinated, yeah. and it was based on you know Peter's experience with with people very close to him in his life, and of course, like anybody else, he can get angry, combated, excited, and this is like when I get that way, even if I'm feeling like really smart and like I win the argument, it feels yucky. It's kind of, there's a residue, but when I follow the four steps, I always feel good. Yeah, that, that is a very good reminder. And I hope that everybody, if anybody looks like thumbs through it at whatever your local bookstore is and thinks, oh, well, this seems a little bit like executive leadership, be please consider again, because <clears throat> not only is Howard bringing his, uh, his, his concepts of coaching into it, um, it really is applicable for almost anyone. I actually, for even parenting, uh, not even, certainly mm -hmm. for parenting, I looked at it, I'm, my, I'm now a grandmother, so I'm re-looking at parenting through my daughter and my 18-month or 17-month-old little grandson. So I'm kind of reliving oh. what I would, how, how I was when I was an exhausted new mom and what I would do differently. And, and my daughter asks for advice. And I often say, I have zero idea. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm very out of date for all that. But I do in my head, think about it all the time. And this idea, just having read the, the, your, the, the galleys of your book, this idea of first ask, asking for permission, being an ally, thinking about the outcome, I mean, you just can't go wrong mm. using that and being reminded oh. to use it. Thank you. And I, you know, I just got this hit, like to say to your daughter, I have no idea is actually a beautiful entree to a conversation, right? Because yeah. now she's like, I would, if someone said, I have no idea, like I'd go back to them. I said, Hey, can I, you know, can I talk to you about this problem as opposed to someone who has all the ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Not this grandma. <laughs> I don't have any idea. No, because I didn't think I was such a success to be. I mean, in the long run, I feel like we were very successful with, with our kids because they're wonderful and they're still very, very close to us. But in the details, no, I don't know. It was crapshoots and luck and sometimes some wisdom, I'm sure. But so, yeah, maybe, maybe that has been, um, maybe that keeps that line of communication open more. Maybe we should all, well, we should all try that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Peter Bregman has a TEDx talk called I Don't Know. Oh. In which, so he sometimes calls himself the world's expert on not knowing. Well, that is, that, that, that's great. I, I'm going to look for that. I'm going to put some of the notes in, uh, some, some of the things we've referred to in the notes for the show. So if people um, are interested, they can just kind of thumb through for some of that. I will try and find the, the link for, for the TED talk. It's called I Don't Know. Uh, Peter I Bregman. Think so. Okay. Yeah, well, or something Bregman, like it. I don't know, Ted. If you something can't find like it, that. let me know. I'll, uh, okay. I'll, I'll dig okay. it up. Because I think that's one. Because in coaching, this is what curi that's curiosity without the agenda to really just kind of mm -hmm. ask questions, poke holes in the stories, and see if those stories hold. If, if, if you as a client want to keep that story, you are welcome to keep it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, just as a coach, I mean, how many times are you working with someone in the first five minutes, you know the answer? And you're just sort of waiting for the thing to finish so you can give them the answer or waiting mm -hmm. for them to discover the answer. And then 20 minutes in, you realize, oh, that was totally wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's always a very sickening feeling to me when I feel like I know how this should work, 
I find that kind of sickening because it I feel like now that means I'm not in in the space with my client. So, um, but yeah, it yeah. happens. Yeah. So for us, the practice is, oh yeah, look, there it is. There's the there's the illusion of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It feels so good. Let's let's put that down. Let's come back. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation, Howard. I'm going to have all the links. I hope everybody who's listened to this will pre-order. Um, I don't know. Can you pre-order at all the independent bookstores too? I suppose you can. I know Amazon I so. is helpful for um, some of the uh, publisher type of metrics. That yeah, Am use, Amazon right? definitely help, helps us the most. And, at this, and so I would say, if at all possible, get it from your local independent bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Okay, so there, there's good reasons for both. Um, so and the title of the book is you I'm just gonna make sure I don't say it wrong. You can change other people the four steps to helping colleagues, employees, and even family up their game. And Howard's podcast is plant, plant yourself plant yourself uh, right. plant yourself .com. And you have oh, how many how many episodes are out there now, Howard? Um, I took down a bunch. Oh. <laughs> um, so, but I'm, the number for this week is 478. Wow. wow. I took down a bunch of people who went a little crazy during COVID. Oh, okay. I can, I I'm going to, I'm going to ask you off camera who they were. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I had one, one springs to mind, but <laughs> okay. All right. So, but you have a lot and there's, and, and Howard very often my, my, my podcast, I only have a, maybe an interview per month, but most of yours now are interviews, right? They, they, the whole time I've only done, I think three where it was just me talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm gonna I, I really, I really admire that. people like who can just talk for an hour and like, talk, Sid. <laughs> like sitting, yeah, Sid and you like, and that's, uh, you know, I do, I do interviews cause it's easier. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, okay, so that's gonna be great. So live, uh, plant yourself is a wealth of information. And so I, um, I've talked about you a million times, but that I want everybody to follow you subscribe to your podcast too, because then there will also be more information about the book as it comes out. And any, any, uh, any extra other bonus chapters that you're going to be announcing or PDFs or things like that, that you'll be announcing, do you think? as the book comes out? Yeah, so there's, a, there's, a, there's some pre-order bonuses. We were told to create pre-order bonuses, which are, um, it's actually three, people, we, we surveyed my list and Peter's list, say, what, what's the thing you'd want the most? And, every, mm. and the, the um, favorite thing was um, demos of the four steps, like live actual demos of oh, us great. taking people through the process. So I did two, Peter did one, um, and we're, it's going to come with a cheat sheet. So you'll get those right away. So you can listen and sort of follow along with the, uh, with the four steps. And then when the book comes out, you know, you'll get all the, the background stuff, but we've also created a lot of extra resources for the book. Um, we have, I think nine dialogues that are, that we, that are not in the manuscript. We just felt it was going to be just sort of too overwhelming and we weren't sure how to, um, uh, annotate them. So they're going to be sort of annotated interactive so the dialogue and then along the side is going to be like this is we did this from from chapter four. Oh, i see right? so okay. that's Connected. that's where that statement came from mm -hmm. so that people can understand can see it see it in practice wonderful um, all right and, so know, that various cheat sheets and i'm starting to make audios like a, i realized like i do a thing before i start working with someone i do a like a three minute body scan for myself and then go into my intentions so I, I turned that into an audio so people can use that, if, you know, to help prepare for step one to become an ally. So that there's a lot, there's a lot of benefits to pre-ordering your book then. How, yes. Well, yeah, okay. Mostly to me, <laughs> mostly to me and Peter, <laughs> but, that's but okay. also to you. I mean, that's yeah, that's, okay. that's why we're bribing people because it helps us so much. No, that's good. It's good. People, people have gone to all this work to write and create something that didn't exist in the world. We want to, we want to support them. So, all right, H Howard, thank you very much for, I've, I've, I've taken up too much of your time. We're, we're over an hour. So I really appreciate you coming on mm -hmm. and um, I will uh, do the outro and tell all the, all, all the ways that people can connect with you in the future. Thank you, well, Howard. Michelle, thank you so much. It's, it's great to talk to you. And it, it, it means a lot to me. I, 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 I wish we'd gotten your blurb earlier when we could have put it on the, the, the jacket of the book because it, um, 
I, I feel better about the book from this conversation. Like, oh, this really can help people. So I, I really appreciate oh, sure. that, that reflection from you. Oh, good, good. Anything I can do to help, you just call on me. Thanks, Howard. <laughs> awesome. Talk to you later. Bye.